if I don't move Megan Jesus back a little bit, I'll be in big trouble. With the There'll be none of that. Wow, why bother? And you're done. And oh, there's always another word to be said. Let's uh, begin with a moment of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the blessing of the message we have received from our young people, as well as the message we have heard from your scripture. Now, O oh God, as we seek to interpret the scriptures, guide and direct our hearts and minds, that we may be faithful followers in your will and in your way. For we offer this time before you in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 So the second scripture reading comes from the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to Luke, beginning with the 16th verse. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up, excuse me, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he said to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Wouldn't it be great just once to get a sermon that brief? <laughs> That's it. One sentence. He's done. I can't do that. Sorry. What I can do is try to make some meaning over what is going on in the very familiar pair of texts, right? We heard from Isaiah, and then we heard Jesus quote from Isaiah. These are back-to-back -back notions of the same idea. In scholastic circles, they call this Jesus' programmatic sermon. What? <laughs> And what that means is Jesus has come to his hometown, come to the place where he's about to be not so honored, right? They try to run him out of town. And he says, Spirit of the Lord is upon me, bring good news to the poor, to the captives, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he says, this has been fulfilled. Now, what I need you to understand is the year of the Lord's favor is kind of a big deal. I know you're all up on your core Hebrew theology, so I don't need to tell you why that's a big deal, right? Oh, there's one who says they're not sure. So I'll go ahead and rehearse it for their benefit. I know this is going to be repeat for most of you, and I'm sorry. But nevertheless, the year of the Lord's favor, the promise of this is, all, is a bunch of stuff that's all built in together. This is, in essence, proclamation of the year of Jubilee. And I know you know exactly what that means because you've sung songs about it and paid close attention to the details. That the year of Jubilee was the promise that all the slaves are released. That the captives, the prisoners are released from prison. Debts are forgiven. All of them. Of course, there's some downside. The land returns to its rightful owner. So, you know, if you were paying your mortgage, it was forgiven. However... The land returned to its rightful owner. So that may or may not be you. But it was cause for great celebration. And Jubilee was one of those concepts that theoretically had a numerical construct in Jewish tradition that it was to happen every 50 years. But magically, it never seemed to really happen because for those who come on Wednesday nights, how long is a generation in Jewish understanding? 40 years. Very good. 40 years. They know that one. We got that down. 40 years. And so 
if everything happens every 50 years, what does that mean? You never get the relief. You never get the promise. So for Jesus to declare it has happened and fulfilled and is saying is a big deal. But there's an even bigger deal in there for those that are studying the, the word of Messiah. And you may have glossed right over it. The spirit of the Lord has, is upon me because he has anointed me. That's a big deal, right? Because the promise of Messiah is an anointed one. And yet, the anointing was always expected to be done by human hands. The priests had to do the anointing. Samuel anointed David. On and on through the history of the um, monarchy of Israel, there was an anointing ceremony. To this day in England, when a new king or queen takes the throne, they are anointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury. The anointing is a sign of the office. And so Jesus just declared that God directly anointed him. Now, this is where there's a handful of folks out there going, what you're talking about, Willis? you got to be old to get that joke. you got to be Because the anointing didn't take place in Jesus' proclamation by human hands. Which is why all the rabbis and the chief priests are sitting in the back room. Right? And the rabbalizing that comes after all speak well of him is this. That the chief priests and the rabbis are going, wait a minute. You can't do that. And this is the moment where you sigh and go, that's all well and good and rather interesting, Rick, but what does it mean for me today? And what it means for us today is just as Jesus is able to claim the promise of the text of Isaiah, we as church are allowed to proclaim the promise of God for us. We are in a new liturgical year. We're in week three of the new year, right? Even though we don't say to each other Happy New Year for another couple of weeks, we're in a new year. So this is the year for First Christian Church that the Lord's favor will come. You are hearing a proclamation in the name of the Lord that we have entered the year of the Lord's favor. There's a lot of things that church leaders are stressed out about. How many of you, like me, sat around reading articles this week about what's going to happen to charitable giving? Right? Yeah. I know Dick read it. <laughs> he didn't mention it to me, but I know he read it. I don't believe it. Sure, I believe there are people that are going to take advantage of some tax breaks this year that may or may not come next year. But what I also know is most of those breaks happen for those who will still be choosing to itemize deductions because that doesn't go away regardless of what you think you know. But even then, I don't worry. I know, I've gone crazy, right? Here's why I don't worry. I know you. I know you love the Lord. I know you love the church. I know you love and care about the ministries that happen here. And a tax break isn't going to make or break your motivation for what it is you are doing. Because what we are doing as a church is measurable and meaningful. I stood and marveled in the three seconds they let me stand still yesterday. <laughs> As I ran up and down the stairs watching delighted children choose toys. As I watched, I could tell, hungry, not just hungry, hungry people coming and receiving a meal. I saw a community that doesn't necessarily trust each other come together in the name and the spirit of the Lord. And we were a part of it. our ministries and our partnerships with the Parkway Garden Christmas Program. The Christmas Church, as they're being referred to in the neighborhood, is making a difference. But it's not just that. 
our ministries not only extend through the year, they extend throughout the world. Had a conversation just this morning about uh, timing for when we're going to anticipate a visit from some of the people in ministry that we partner with in Belarus coming this summer, or near summer. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited about the fact that more of you are making it more of a priority to come to church every week and you're telling your friends and neighbors that there's good news to be heard. And I thank God for that. I'm excited about the fact that some have joined and more are discerning and we are a vibrant serving community that, oh, by the way, is about to kick off the back to school fair and, 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 is serving in the name of God in so many ways it's impossible to count. When I came here in August, the first thing I did as I sat down and looked at the ministry of the program of this church is I said to my wife, they're doing too much. <laughs> they are doing more, way more, than a church this size could or should normally be able to do. And there's only one way you do that much. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you to proclaim good news to the oppressed, release to those who have been made captive by life's circumstance, and hope for the future for those who need to hear the promise of Jesus Christ. You believe in that. You've accepted that. What you haven't fully accepted yet is that God is blessing your work and will continue to bless it to an exploding, unimaginable level if you'll embrace the idea. So I'm here to proclaim it. And if you want to run me out like Jesus at the end of the day, I dare you. But God said no. I'm declaring it. This is the year of the Lord's favor. This is the year that First Christian Church gets known, gets bigger, gets bolder, does more, serves more, and changes more lives. We're going to pray for healing. We're going to pray for hope. We're going to pray for action. We're going to pray for people to be fed. And you know what? We're going to do all those things. Because I've read the prophecy of Isaiah. And I've read the promise that happened in the Gospel according to Luke. And when God hears a church of believers claim a promise, God gets busy. This is the year of the Lord's faith. We are about to do great things in the name of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Buckle up. <laughs> it's going to be an exciting bucket ride. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.